accept your instructor of the wise by the Holy Ghost. I'm saying it is okay to sit down, okay? Just be sure that's what the Spirit of the Lord is leading you to do, but I would request that. Shalom, Baba. 
just before you take your seat. Um, seconds to talk to the Holy Spirit and say I yield. And this is a very important part of our ceremony tonight. I want you to talk to the Holy Spirit and tell him I yield. To yield is to submit, to agree with his influence, okay? To agree to the intent of his heart. What you're saying is, in other words, you're giving him permission to exert his government upon you. Because there is an ulterior frame that we sustain in this tabernacle that we still dwell in, that makes submission to his promptings sometimes a little bit difficult. But we can submit that authority to him and give him the legitimacy to break every resistance. And that's what you want to do tonight. You want to tell him, Holy Ghost, I come before you again and I yield. I yield. I yield. It's not about tonight's meeting. It's, it's about what his beginning with us, the journey that he's taking us through. So precious Holy Spirit, I come tonight to stand before you as your child, Caleb. And I say that I yield. I yield, Lord. Please be Lord, even over me. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, um, please, just do me a favor and help me find the empty seat in front of you. And, and sit. If there's an empty seat in front of you, that's, that's your seat. <laughs> Except for the people behind me, of course. <laughs> um, man of God, please come this way. Okay. Hallelujah. Okay, Emmanuel, there's an empty seat in front of you. So yield. <laughs> yield, sir. Yield. Yeah, you can keep it somewhere there. I'll bring it to me. You see, now there's an empty seat in front of Christy. Hallelujah. Antigonia, is there an empty seat in front of you? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, I want to be out of your face real quickly so that we can pray, okay? Amen. Um, if you cannot hear me, say amen. <laughs> okay, if you can hear me, say amen. Hallelujah. I won't be out of your face real quickly. Um, it's good to see us again. It's good to be with us again. We bless the Lord for the opportunity to meet again in, in this manner. We have trusted for it for quite a while. And it's happening today. Amen. Hallelujah. And um, we trust God to help us. As the progression continues, in the name of Jesus. So I'm officially welcoming you again. Good to see you, sir. Please help me shake somebody to your left and right. If you don't have somebody to your left or right, it was because the person refused to take the front seat. <laughs> also seeing some faces that we probably haven't met. Um, we love you and you're welcome. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Oh, Jesus. Somebody help me read something. Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 18. Maybe that'd be a good place for us to begin. Second Samuel 18, 18. Second Samuel 18, 18. You dare say amen. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and read up for himself a pillar which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And it is called unto this day Absalom's place. Amen. Hmm. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. I'll just read all the scriptures so that I can raise a prayer point and we can go. Luke 22, 19. If you're there, help me, please. And give unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this do in remembrance of me. Let's begin from here. Um, Second Samuel 18, 18, what we're looking at is Absalom. And the Bible says that now Absalom in his lifetime, lifetime had taken and read up for himself a pillar, which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. It is called us until this day Absalom's place. Now, please, I need you to understand and keep in mind the authority of Scripture. Amen? Keep in mind that there is an authority that the prophetic utterances captured in the Scriptures hold. I want to say still hold, but it's not like they're going to ever lose that. Amen? And when the scripture says that it is called us unto this day, it is not making reference to the time in which that particular scripture was written. Amen? Because if that's the only plane on which we want to look at it, then it means that it may not be true with this day. Amen? Are we together? If you are writing a note on the 1st of January, 2020, and you said up until now, this is this. It means that if somebody reads that note on the 31st of December in 2020, he can doubt whether that thing still exists in that manner. True, right? Because that thing was written on the 1st of January, and you're reading it on the 31st of December. Hmm? 
But when the scripture is saying that this is so up unto this day, understand that the person who is inspiring this writing is an eternal spirit, an eternity himself is, is only a fraction of the, the expression of his life. So whether or not that place still exists like that in the natural, the scripture says that that place it, to this day is called after Absalom's name. So if you find yourself journeying in the pathways, and somehow in the spirit you stumble at a place, it can be introduced to you that this place is Absalom's place. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? Because everything that is a thing in the natural is actually a birthing of another in the supernatural. Amen? So if there is a place that was ordained and given certain characteristics and given a name, it was that the essence of that man was poured into a physical place because he has a spiritual essence. Are we together? Are we together? Yes. So, whether or not, whether or not you can find that place on Google Map, is not the problem. The scripture says that there is a place, and that place till today, it's called after a And so, if you were there in his physical timeline, the Bible says that because that man didn't have a son, that he labored to be. Build a pillar, you know. You may just wake up in the morning and see Absalom, and he's walking, he's walking, and you're like, Okay, you did build the house. And Absalom will say, No, I'm not trying to build a house. Then you look and look, and after a while, you see that he has built a pillar. Okay, what's this man up to? Then you come back after a while, he's not building anything again apart from that pillar. observe and you now find that that pillar he gave a name he called that pillar his name and the reason why he did that was because he didn't have a son to keep his name in remembrance are we together are we together to keep his what his name in remembrance and you would think that Excuse me. And he was just being very emotional. Okay, I, I don't have a family, you know, who would carry on my name. And you know how we do it. If you've watched Nollywood, you know how those evil men drop. <laughs> Sorry if you're evil here. Yeah. It's just Nollywood, okay? <laughs> it's just Nollywood. <laughs> but we declare a change in that system. In the name of Jesus. All right, but we're accustomed with a culture that seems to trouble the female folk so much for a male child because the man who wants someone to continue his name. I, we don't know what they're doing, but this also looks like something that can fit that description. Amen? Only that we understand that from this context, when these guys are speaking about a name, they are not exactly speaking about, give me a name, Bulus. Shaibu. Something. That's not what they're talking about. They are, they are speaking about the very essence, the advantages that their lives opened up on account of their work with God. Amen. And knowing that these things are eternally abundant and cannot be exhausted in their own lifetime, they send it down through generations, through their songs. Amen. That, that's one of the things called the blessing. That a man will look and sit down and bless his sons. What he's actually doing is that he's, he's impacting his name upon the son. Are we together? And the Bible says that Absalom did this with a pillar. Because he didn't want his name to be forgotten. He 
didn't want what he stood for to be lost. That's what it means to be forgotten. Do you understand that? He didn't want for what had been given to him as his inheritance is in God to stop speaking because he left time. And not being able to find someone to release it to, he released it on a place. And the Bible says, up until this day, Last night, God and I were watching videos of Apostle Babalola and how the place he used to pray, even long after he had gone, they, they bring mad people into the room for deliverance. I don't say they pray for them for deliverance, they bring them into the room for deliverance. That something had rested on that place and it's strong enough to correct the problem of insanity. They had dropped something on that place. Amen. But then see where we are going. We now come back to the lifetime of Jesus. And then we see that Jesus is almost at the end of his ministry. He calls his disciples together and begins to speak many things to them in what we know as the communion. Amen. That then the Bible says that he took bread, he broke it. And he says that this is my body broken for you. In other words, I'm about to die. Amen. What I'm doing with this bread is about to happen to me. Amen. And he gave them that mystery, what we know as the ministry, the mystery of the communion, right? And he gave them that mystery and he said, do this. What? In remembrance of me. I look at that statement and it worries me a little. I must be very honest with you, sir. Mars. It worries me because these, these are people that Jesus had worked with for a number of years. Right? They had gone through all manner of, of experiences together. They've, they've seen the man walk on water. They've seen him come the sea. They've seen him miracles. They've seen fish and bread multiply. All kinds of stuff. They have by encounter with him began to walk into these things. And then Jesus is about to go. And suddenly he's saying to them that I want to teach you something. I want to give you something. And the the scope, the aim of why I'm giving you this thing is so that you can remember me. Are we still together? Are we still together? And so was Jesus saying, was Jesus saying that these guys were going to forget him? Is that what Jesus was trying to say? That I'm about to go and after so much that we have shared together, after so much that we have shared together, there is still a tendency for you to forget. Let me show you something. I think this is this is Second Peter. I think let's find it. Second Peter chapter one verse thirteen. Read for me. Please let's read that together. One to go.
that's written, that's written on the further, knowing that shortly I must put up this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able to, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Now, see what Peter is doing here. He's about to leave again. Amen? Remember, Jesus was about to leave when he brought that mystery. Peter is about to leave, and then he's writing to the church, and he's saying that there's been so much we have shared together. There's been so much that has happened. There's been so much I have taught you. But as long as I am still in this tabernacle, I find it important for me to put these things in remembrance. And I desire that even after I have gone, that you'll be able to put these things in remembrance. Two things he's saying there. Number one, he's saying that there is a propensity to forget. Amen. And that's what he's establishing. establishing. And he's saying that that probability to forget is actually tied to something about this tabernacle that we still bear. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, when Jesus was leaving, and Jesus said to them, in this communion, one of the strong things that we're touching is, is a ritual that brings you into remembrance. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, please, take your mind off. That's why there's no bread and wine today. Amen. Because I don't want you to think of it in what you do. I'm trying to help you see the things you touch in communion. Praise the Lord. Amen. What happens to you in communion? Every time that you are in his presence, every time you come to the Lord and your heart is open before him and you touch that life, that place of communion, one of the things that it does to you is to bring again that mystery of remembrance. Because, see, there is there is that which stands as your reality and definition in God. The Bible says in, in Jeremiah that before you were formed, I knew you. Do you understand that? So, there is your definition in God, but there is also something about this tabernacle that seems to limit your ability to live in reference to what your definition is in God. And so, every time there seems to be a need for God to speak his word into your heart and bring you in remembrance to what you are in him. Are you following? Are you following? There's always, there's always a need. There's always a need for the hearts of men, the eyes of men, to be tilted back again to what is supposed to be the original focus from whence your life should take bearing. That's the protocol that Jesus was trying to introduce to them. He says in communion, what happens in everything you do happens in remembrance. Think about the mighty episode of killing 400 prophets. Think about the... I, I don't know about you, but if that thing happens that I, I read an author in Banawa, eh, and I cry, and fire comes down. <laughs> Man of God, fire! I put on the other I bombed. The drench I dug around it, the fire licked it. <laughs> at least, at least for that whole year. <laughs> eh? For that whole year. <laughs> if I'm walking on the street, <laughs> don't do 
as if you don't know what I'm talking about. Eh? Just if you don't know. At least when I'm walking on the street. Ah! Hey! It's not like I would try to do it too. Do you understand what I'm saying? But there's there's something that will happen to my heart on account of that experience. But not so long after that day. In fact, the news the news got to Jezebel that your prophets were killed. She replied him uh, upon that news reaching him and said, "So be it to me if this thing doesn't happen to you." Ah! And the Bible says that the man of God that just called that fire. He packed his bag and left town. <laughs> he, he ran until he fainted in the wilderness. And an angel had to come and help me. God said, what are you doing here? Then he now began to complain and say, I am not better than my fathers. Now watch what was happening. Suddenly, this man who stood and said, as surely as the Lord liveth before whom I stand. See where he was taking his reference from. Suddenly began to speak to God and said, I am not better than my father. See another reference. Suddenly he was bringing God education. That See how we weigh men. Eh? And by my examination, compared to this, I have failed. What happened to that heart, my friend? It's a description of forgetting. That's what happened to that heart. So I'm not talking about what happens in your memory after time has elapsed. No. I'm talking about a season when something sits upon your heart and that what should be the light that powers your journey? At that moment, you are described as one who has forgotten. And so Jesus was saying that in communion, every time bread is broken, meanwhile, he's talking about himself. Every time he releases himself to you to eat, what happens as light comes in is not that you are told something that you never knew. It's just that you are brought into remembrance. Have you read the scripture before? And suddenly a light shines and you were like, I never saw this before. Actually, from when you were born as a seed of God, you knew this all the while. When a man begins to draw reference from his life, from many other things apart from God and what God has said, that man is forgotten. When a man stands and cannot find his life navigating on the strength of what has been released upon him as a child of God, as a sent one, as one who is ordained and called of God, you see, that one, one has forgotten. says in Romans that and if ye be dead with Christ even as the glory of the Father I'm paraphrasing now, even as he was raised by the glory of the Father even so should ye walk in the newness of life I don't, I don't want to go less, I don't want to have us read it again because of time the Bible says that if you were dead with Christ even as he was raised by the glory of the Father even so should ye walk in the newness of life. What he's saying is that the agency by which Christ was raised from the dead is the glory of the Father. And it is that same agency that should power the everyday life of a Christian. Are we together? Are we together? 
he described the walking of the Holy Ghost. He called him the glory of the Father. Amen. Praise the Lord. He says that even so, should ye walk in the newness of life. Meaning that the Lord is not expecting you to express him as his son if you don't find your bearing in glory. He's saying that we should read the scripture. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, please. That's what he's saying. If you're there, say amen. Let's say that we're going to read it together. Are you there? Whoops. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Verse 4. Let's read it together. One, two, go. Therefore... We are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. As though Paul was trying to describe the operating system of a Christian. He's saying that you were brought into the death of Christ by baptism so that the agency, the same power that was released upon Jesus to bring him back to life would be the agency that powers your living. Amen? Are we together? He says, so that the same glory, the same glory that brought him back would become the reference, Hamza, that powers your everyday expression. In other words, like I was saying, the Father is not expecting you, Emmanuel, to be a Christian outside glory. Let me say it this way. He's not expecting you, Favor, to be successful in your attempt to represent him outside glory. Do you understand that? So, your your breathing, your walking, your sleeping, your cooking, your eating, is expecting that every expression of you as a man, whether a man in the flesh or in the spirit, will be, will be powered by the same glory that brought Jesus from the dead. What I'm trying to describe to you is is there's perpetual failure in the report card of an average Christian today because we are trying every other thing except what has been given to us. Have you ever had an encounter in glory? Of course, you, you should have, right? I, I want us to talk. I want us to relate to this, okay? Think about that time when you stood in the presence of God and the strength of his love, the strength of his heart just overwhelmed you and nothing else mattered. Whether you were going to write an exam the next day, <laughs> And you did not read. You were not afraid whether that you would fail. It was not. Your mind didn't conceive a possibility of failure. Do you understand that? Have you ever been in in his embrace? And you're you're not sad, but you can't stop crying. Have you been in that place before? Where you are afraid, afraid of the strength of, of life that is pouring from his eyes, yet you are dancing on it with, with a stream of joy that you can't explain. Have you been in that place before? I'm saying that those things we encounter in heavy moments in the heats of our meetings are as it were introductions to encounters in his glory. But the scripture is saying that your, your success as a child of God 
realize that you are powered by this. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's saying that you are you are you are powered by this same thing, so that you are walking on the street with that same mode of heart that you had while you were in your room, and all that mattered was the will of God. That you want to take a bike, and the reason why you call that bike is because Jesus is beautiful. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? That the man says, No, my money is not 100. It's, it's 150. And that's probably all you have. But Jesus is beautiful. And that's the reason why you cannot but give him. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to say that you're, I'm not talking about what we call manifestations of the sun. No, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your everyday expression. Your everyday normal should be a derivative from the glory of God. The reason why we can get angry at our brothers is because we have forgotten that Jesus is beautiful. The reason why it is, 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 is possible that you will do something then, I will not be offended. Then it will not take me two months for me to be delivered from that offense is because me, I have forgotten that Jesus is beautiful. I'm supposed to live life caught up in the beauty of his face. Do you understand that? He was ordained that I would go through life caught up in the splendor, the bliss of his heart. That's the Christian that God is looking for. explain that the matter of forgetting is not what happens in time because the devil can orchestrate attacks on the heart of a man to shift him out of focus so that he can forget especially when there are testimonies of sin around your life when he orchestrates a fall here orchestrates another one here orchestrates another one here you, you, have, you will fall to a point where you will get up and, and say the word of God in my life is a lie you see at that moment you have forgotten Do you understand? 
that you're trying to sleep and there are demons everywhere. He said, don't cast them. You leave your house and go up. He said, they cannot follow you up. Christianity, Christianity is a breed of people living from up. Do you understand that? Is the culture expressed by a generation of people living from up? That these guys are locked up. That's what the scripture speaks about when it says that he that abides under he that dwelleth in the secret place shall what? Under the shadow of the Almighty, that there's such a thing as abiding under. No, let me put it this way: abiding in a place where you are overshadowed by the Almighty. I'm not saying that you stand in a meeting and the anointing comes on you, and suddenly you're operating in the spirit of might. All of those things are introductions. It's a schooling system of what can be your perpetual reality. I'm saying that you can abide such that you are overshadowed by the Almighty. We're only weak because we forget. We only get discouraged because we forget. But that's okay. That's a limitation in the flesh. There is a possibility in the spirit. No, there is a possibility in in the one that now expresses the life of God, the one that now defines our existence as children of God, such that we don't forget. Jesus spoke and said that the words that I speak, those words are spirit and their life. But he said, see, spirit and life, it is the Holy Ghost that will put you in remembrance of spirit and life. So a man rises up and is excited and tells me he had an encounter and God told him he will be this and this and this and this. And in the next three months, he's crying because he doesn't understand his lies. You know that one? That one has forgotten. And the reason why he's forgetting is because he's not living in the Holy Ghost. This is what I brought to you tonight. There is no Christianity outside the Holy Ghost. All there is outside him are attempts with one end. Only one end and we know the end. Scripture says that the labor is a fool. We read every one of them. Because you know it not the way to the city. Weariness is the end of every attempt to be a child of God outside the Holy Ghost. shows up with whatever utterance she carried on her tongue. And Peter denied Jesus in her face. That was Peter trying to be Peter in Peter. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? That was Peter trying to be what God ordained him to be in himself. I'm trying to say that we can switch into that one that should be our operating system. Because we were brought into the death of Christ by baptism so that the glory of the Father that brought him back to life will be the same agency that powers our everyday living. I have a question for you. Did you die with Christ? Yes or no? If yes is the answer, say yes. Because yes is the answer. Did you die with Christ? If you died with Christ, it means it has become... One of your primary rights in God to live 
perpetually in his embrace. Why don't we see this? Many of the times we are trying to come into glory with the mentality of a laborer who deserves a reward. Are we together? Many of the times we are trying to break into these things that we read about in scripture with the idea that I will pray 10 hours for one month and I will come out with fire. It is true that there is a system in God that rewards faithfulness and diligence. Amen. But if you understand the scriptures well, you will know that there is no reward God gives outside Himself. Do you understand that? that God doesn't give you anything outside Himself. In fact, you don't need anything outside God. Amen. But at the same time, it is a blessed and eternal mystery that if it was not God that powered you into coming into whatever should bring that reward, what you did is not, is not, is not commensurate to anything. Do you understand? A reward is a price for something that you have done well and so we're rewarding you, right? Now, every day that stands before God will be judged and tested by the God life. So if it was not God that powered it in the first place, it will not have stature enough to stand before God. So you don't have a reward if God did not give you what you need. Ask grace to do what you did. Do you understand that? If it was not God that powered it on the inside of you, there's no reward for you. Are we following? Are we still together? So I'm saying that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, glory is the beginning of a man's journey and glory is the end. Glory is what powers your journey and glory is the only hope that you are looking out for when you arrive at the day of judgment. into me. Do you know that you don't know how to press into God? Do you know that God knows that you don't know how to pray? Mm. Yes. Your father knows that there's only one that knows how to pray. His name is prayer. Do you understand that? He knows it is his son. There's no prayer outside his son. And he knows that you don't know how to pray. He knows that until his son comes to you and energizes you by his life, you cannot pray. And so he made them, when the disciples came to him to say, teach us to pray. One of the very strong things Jesus said to them is that when you pray, say, give us this day our daily bread. The father 
knows that the demand upon your life, not even as an apostle or whatever, as a child of God, is impossible outside the atmosphere of his glory. And so, as a son of God, there is what is referred to as the daily allocation for the experience of his glory. Did I say daily? Sorry. There is such a thing as a perpetual existence from the plane of glory. forgotten. I'm not saying that we don't have them in our minds. No. But we have forgotten them. Our hearts have lost the posture that it should sustain on account of that knowledge. That's what it means to forget. But there is one tonight who has come to turn again the hearts of men to the speakings of God when he sets them forth into time. You know God has called you. You know but the thing you did three days ago speaks to your heart and it is louder and because of the, the strength of that thing you cannot rise in the boldness of a son of God no wait wait there is one there is one who comes with a ministry to remember he's called the comforter and when he comes he will bring you in remembrance to the things said concerning you what you have forgotten it must be perpetually before your eyes for you to give back to that reality your heart must be tuned to that frequent frequency continuously continuously the day you lose that frequency you lose what it takes to give back to it but but friends i didn't come to talk about the problem i came to talk about the provision that the father made how be it when the comforter shall come Leave all of that. 
that there is that which was said concerning you. The Bible says that even till now, that place is so called Absalom because he placed his name upon it. So whether or not erosion happened on that place, that's what happened in time. That place can be brought back into remembrance. If the Holy Ghost breathes upon that same vicinity again, that same reality that that man blessed that ground with suddenly begins to find expression. sending Jesus said and when the comforter shall come whom the father will send in my name
expression. How can I be afraid of fulfilling it? What God already completed. No. When I arrive like that, it's just that I have forgotten. But thank God for the Holy Ghost who comforts us in days like that. It is my reality and I will live in it by the privilege that Jesus gave me. I will live in the beauty. In, in, I will live caught up. Caught up in the gaze of the face of Jesus. That's your secret place, my friend. That's your place. That's your place. So they sack you from work. Of Jesus, I don't know anything else that Jesus has not told me. So Jesus did not tell me I will lack. I cannot be destroyed.
Shango, I will speak the words in my heart. I come to you that you would remember that you are loved. I come to you that you would remember that your heart will be brought back into that place that it must function from powered by the revelation of my God. And so some of us from here will begin to be taken into encounters you see again